Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about hybrid force motion control. In the previous video, if you remember, we talked about pure or ideal force control, where you have a force at the end effector called F-tip, and uh, if you have tactile sensors or six axis four torque sensors, you can measure it, can subtract it from the ideal or desired force and get a force error and then use that term in a, uh, as you can see here, PI controller plus fit forward, as well as the uh, feedback linearization to uh, make the system apply the force that you desire. Now we learned that this uh, case is ideal because it needs really your end effector to not move freely in any direction. So it should be hold in it should be held in place or like um, restrained to uh, something that does not allow it move in any direction. That way you can control the amount of force in all directions. In reality, the end effector does move freely in some directions. And in some other directions, there are some motion constraints which do not allow the motion to happen. So what you really need is hybrid force motion control. In those directions that the end effector can move freely, you want to control the motion. In the directions that the end effector cannot move, you want to control the amount of force, right? So, uh, for example, again, I guess I mentioned this example, but let's say your end effector like here is uh, grabbing a pen and writing something like a piece of paper. So if I want to talk about this compliance frame, in the X and Y direction, your end effector should be able to move freely. Maybe it is following a trajectory, right? Maybe it is uh, drawing some circle or writing some letters. In the Z direction, however, because of the normal force from the plane, it does not allow the Z motion to happen. So Z motion, there is really uh, no motion. It's completely constrained, but you have to control how much of force you are applying in that direction, because a little bit of force means you cannot write properly on the paper, and a lot of force means you're gonna break the pen. So you need to have a combination of the motion control that we learned in the uh, uh, a few of the previous lectures, whether it was the centralized or centralized approach, and the ideal force control that we learn, which is in the previous video. Now for motion control, we are going to follow the multivariable centralized approach, right? Or the feedback linearization approach, as well as the uh, force control, we also use the same thing. So how do you combine? So uh, first, a couple of things reminding you about what we have, and then we're going to talk about the uh, uh, control law. So there is a condition in hybrid motion, force motion control is called this reciprocity condition, reciprocity. Okay, hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly. Reciprocity, it's called from reciprocal, right? Which is kind of like uh, two ways. It says if the end effector twist is zeta and if the end effector wrench is F, right? So F involves forces and torques and xi, actually it's not zeta, xi. Xi includes the velocity linear and velocity angular components. Then we can say that xi transpose F equals zero. What does that mean? It means in the direction of the constraint, in the directions of motion, that there is a constraint, um, there is no work done, okay, as well as the other three directions. What does that mean? You know, it's a dot product. It's a dot product between velocity and force. And uh, if you remember work from your uh, knowledge of dynamics, hopefully, work, or a small work uh, term, dw is either what? It is either um, um, f dot dr, right? Or you can say r transpose does dot f, if you want. Like dr, let me write it, 
uh, dr transpose times f or uh, d theta transpose times uh, t or tau. Correct? But if you combine this dr and d theta together and f and tau together, right? So these two you combine into the uh, range and these two, they're time derivatives, of course, you combine into what? Xi. The only thing is you take a time derivative from both sides. So here you will get this. And you know time derivative of dr over dt is v. And time derivative of d omega over d, uh, d theta over dt is omega. Okay, so this condition saying that dw over dt, which is also power, power is equal to zero. Uh, for the end effect. What, what does that mean, really? Let's, let's take a look back into this example. So in the directions that I'm free to move, x, c, and y, c, what's going to happen here? Do I, do, does my end effector uh, do work in the direction of x, c, and y, c? No, because it does not apply any force. So in this direction, if I want to say f of tip the y component is equal to zero the same thing as what um, f tip component x is also zero in those directions the end effector is not applying a force okay so of course it is not going to do any work in the z direction, it does apply some force. So it is going to be f uh, tip, right? And z component, that's not zero. But guess what? The displacement in that direction is zero. Right? For the tip. So in this direction that it does apply a force, it doesn't do any displacement. So still dw or dw over dt is zero. In the directions that it doesn't apply a force, although it moves, there is no force. So still the work term is what? Zero. Okay, so we can write it for um, those specific things. Now, keep in mind that when we talk about this condition, this is for ideal condition with no frictions. And also, your environment is perfectly rigid. So these are the two assumptions that we used when we uh, wrote this uh, reciprocity condition. Is there is no friction, because if there is a friction, then here, even if you want to keep the speed constant in the x or y direction, your fx or fy should be at least equal to friction and overcome the friction for the end effector to move at a constant velocity. So here we assume that what? When I say these two are zero, we assume that there is no friction. And when I said in the z direction there is no displacement, what does it mean? It means the plate, or in general the environment, is what? is fully or ideally rigid. So even if I push on that plate with the end effector very hard, it's not going to bend, it's not going to move. If it does, then the displacement is not zero in the z direction. So you see, ideal condition of no friction and completely rigid environment. In reality, these are not the case. The environment is not fully rigid. There is some friction. So how do you handle that? That's the topic of our next video, especially non-rigid uh, environment, how to work in a non-rigid environment, which is the real life. That's where we talk about impedance control. Okay, but right now for this hybrid uh, force motion control law that I'm about to say, we definitely assume the environment is fully rigid. Okay, so those constraints then we have on the motion, the constraint that you have on the motion, you are going to write them as A of Q times Xi equals zero.
okay? And this zero here is also a vector, okay? It's not this number zero. So you write them as what? As Fafian constraint, which I have discussed in my previous videos. You assume that whatever motion that you have on the, uh, whatever constraint you have on the motion, you can write them as a Fafian constraint. So let me write them that these motion constraints can be written as uh, Fafian constraints, okay? If that is the case, then we can easily incorporate those motions into our equations of motion in the task space. By the way, here we deal with equations of motion in the task space, not in the joint space. Why? Because the force of the end effector and the motion of the end effector, they are both described in the task space. Okay, so we better start our equations, governing equations of motion directly in the task space instead of going back in the workspace and then use inverse kinematics and so many other things. Okay, so you see here when I'm down and I talk about equations of motion for the robot, I talk directly in the task space. So here, the um, wrench term is equal to what? Is equal to the uh, matrix lambda times xi dot plus matrix eta of q and zeta and xi. This guy has Coriolis term, centripetal term, and gravity term. And this xi we had we had both of these. If you remember in one of our previous videos, if we go when we talked about equations of motion in the um, uh, task space, we derived all of those. We found that this lambda, capital lambda, was J transpose inverse MJ inverse, okay? So we had the definitions of these. These are not new. And this eta is this huge term that you can see here. As you can see, it involves the C matrix, and it involves G, as well as there is J dot term in it. Okay, so calculation of this uh, eta and uh, lambda are quite big, especially eta. But we had these equations, right? So this is the equation of motion for the robot in the task space. And if there is what? If there is force at the end effector, then you have to add the wrench term at the end effector as F tip at the end of the equation. And that's exactly what you see I'm using here. Right? Lambda xi dot plus eta plus f tip. Okay? So this is the equation of motion that we have in the workspace. And the motion constraint, we write them as Fafian constraint. For example, for this case, right? What is it? Can I write the fact that in the z direction, I cannot move? So I have to write it as like velocity z equals zero for the end effector. Can I write it as some matrix times xi equals zero. Remember your xi in this case is what? It's v and omega. So it is going to be like vx, vy, vz, and then omega x, omega y, and omega z. So what should I multiply by this to make only vz zero? All you need is basically to multiply it by this matrix 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. If I multiply this matrix A, or A of Q in general, in this case, it's just constant. If I multiply A by Xi, that exactly gives me what? The constraint equation that I have. So in this case, my A matrix is constant, but not always. In many cases, your A matrix is a function of the joint variables. Okay, going back here. Um... How many motion constraints do I have? How many force constraints? Or um, in which directions can I, should I apply specific forces? So here we assume that your robot has n degrees of freedom. And here we consider the com most complete case where n is equal to 6. Not always your robot has 6 degrees of freedom. In many cases, your robot only has 2 degrees of freedom like the two degree of freedom planar arm, then n is two. 
Now, out of this uh, n degrees of freedom that you have, in general, we assume that k of them, there is motion constraint. Where those motion constraints, as I told you, can be written as A of Q times I equals zero, right? Now, the question is, what's the dimension of Xi? The dimension of Xi is the same as N, the total degrees of freedom. So, in general, this Xi is like N by 1. And so, if you have K constraints, then this guy has to be K by N. And this is going to be K by 1. So the dimension of your matrix A is k by n, where k is the number of motion constraints and n is the number of degrees of freedom. And that's what you see here when an n of 6 is used in general. Here I have changed uh, 6 back to n because not always you have 6 degrees of freedom. So in uh, k directions, as I say, out of n, you have motion constraint. You cannot really move your robot in those directions, or it's a combination of uh, the motions that give you a constraint. And uh, in the n minus k directions, you have free motion. Okay, so uh, let me write it for you here, or we call it uh, motion-free constraints. Um, uh, Constraint free motion, I'm sorry. So free motion. Okay, so in these directions that there is free motion, you want to control the motion. Although it's free, but you really want to control. And in the directions that uh, there is a constraint, you cannot move, you want to control the force. Okay, so now with all that said, as I said, the equation of motion is uh, what you can see over here. Uh, the wrench is equal to lambda zeta plus eta plus f tip. Now, when your constraint can be written as a times xi equals zero, then... If you remember from our previous videos, we can say that this F of tip that you have is the force of those constraints, of those motion constraints, right? So when you say you want to control the force, by force you really mean the components of F of tip. You want to control them. And F of tip can be written, if you remember from the videos that we had on incorporating your constraints, right, your Fafian constraint into the equations of motion, you remember that that F of tip that you had was written as A transpose times lambda, where A is the same A matrix, and lambda is what we call the Lagrangian multipliers. These are the extra unknowns that you add to your equations in order to incorporate the constraints, right? So now, when you write these equations, you have, in general, how many unknowns? Well, this lambda is k by 1, right? It's the same as your, um, your uh, zero vector. So there are k of these. Why k? Because I have k motions. For any motion constraints, you incorporate one lambda. So this lambda vector, in general, has k constraints. And you also have what? You also have n of these uh, xi dots, right? Xi dot is an acceleration term because xi itself is velocity. So xi dot is acceleration, linear and angular. So in general, you have, if you remember, you have a plus k unknowns, right? n xi dots and k lambdas. That's what you have as unknown. But remember that you also have k constraint equations. And these k constraint equations are in terms of xi, not xi dot. But your unknowns are xi dot. So instead of 
using the original constraint equation, you take a time derivative from them. Why would you do so? Because when you take time derivative, then the term xi dot would appear. So now equation number two gives you k equations, and in those k equations, your uh, unknown xi dot appears. Right, so now this first one, equation number one, will give you n equations. And this equation number two, which is time derivative of the original equations, this one gives you k equations. So you have k equations, n equations, and uh, uh, n plus k equations, n plus k unknowns. And you should be in general to what? You should be able to solve. Okay, how do we solve for our unknowns? Uh, we basically find uh, xi dot um, from equation number one. We solve for xi dot and then replace it down into equation two. So basically eliminate xi dots between one and two. That gives us the lambda. And lambda, if you remember, if you multiply the matrix A transpose by lambda, guess what? Those are the forces at the tip, correct? So if you do that, if you find xi dot from one, replace it in two, this relation that you see here is what you will get for what? For lambda, and proof of that is not hard, it's just a little bit of algebra, you can easily do that. And uh, fine, now what? Now, if I need to plug back this lambda that I found in 3, plug it back into 1. Why? Because now I want to get my equations of motion. I want equations for xi dots, right, for acceleration terms. So now I plug this 3 back into 1, and by 3, I really mean this portion of it, not all of it, just this portion. Okay, the part that you found lambda, you plug it back into the equation 1, and if you do so, it gives you this bottom equation here. This is the equation of motion for those directions that are constraint free. Okay, which looks like the original equation with some differences. So you still have this term here, uh, lambda plus eta, lambda xi dot plus eta. And you still have F. The only thing is on both sides, left and right of the equation 1, there is a P matrix that is multiplied. And P here, again, it's not hard, just you need to plug 3 in 1. You can show that P matrix is what? The identity matrix minus all of this, which is a transpose inverse of A lambda inverse, a transpose A lambda inverse. So it, it has a bunch of calculations. But once you calculate it, what's the role of this P matrix here? What's the role of this? This P matrix in general is 6 by 6, or in this case, we can say N by N. It's what we call a projection matrix. What is a projection matrix? What does it do? Well, remember that not all of your N degrees of freedom are now free to move. In K of them, you cannot move. There is a constraint. In n minus k of them, you can move. So the goal of this P matrix is to separate from the n degrees of freedom n minus k of them that there is free motion. And that's exactly what this matrix does. First of all, this matrix is not full rank matrix. Although it's n by n, it has only rank n minus k. So what does it do? When you apply it to both left and right side of the equation of motion, it projects the wrench and the right hand side term onto the subspace of the motions that are free to move. Basically, again, if I want to uh, uh, specify it in plain English, <laughs> what it does, out of this F, that is like n degrees of freedom, right? Because F is n by 1. When you multiply this P by it, although it is n by n, but it only has a rank n minus k. So what it does, it projects this as a new F. You might call it F prime. 
which has n minus k dimensions, because the other directions are going to be zero, this matrix only has rank n minus k, and this f prime n minus k will be what? Will be like xi, uh, sorry, lambda, like a new xi dot prime plus what? A new eta where the direct dimensions of these are also n minus k. So basically what it gives you, it converts your original equations of motion into a new set of equations where the dimensions are reduced only to n minus k because this n minus k are the constraint free motions. Remember, in the k other directions, you can not move. You can not move. So then what? What do you do about those k directions that don't move? In this n minus k directions, you can move. These are your equations of motion. Fine. In those k directions that you cannot move, remember, you should control what? The force. How would you do that? And this is where the matrix I minus P, because P itself is I minus that, so if you bring P to the uh, right-hand side and you bring this negative matrix to the left-hand side, I minus P is going to be this whole thing. This I minus P is a matrix that has rank what? It has rank K. So if I use this matrix instead of P matrix for projection, what does this one do? Well, it projects my equations into the subspace where the constraint exists. And that's exactly what you see here in the motion force hybrid control law. If you look here, my control law has two components or three components in general. One part of it is motion control. One part of it is force control. One part is the feedback linearization to cancel out Coriolis and gravity, and of course, centripetal. And I'll tell you about the J transpose. But what am I using in this big control law? I am using P matrix for the part that I'm doing motion control. And I'm using I minus P for the part that I'm doing what? Force control to do the proper projections. How do I do the motion control? The same way that we did it earlier. If you remember, we used a PD or a PID control. So here you see there is a PID control here. Feedback PID. Right? And of course, here I have uh, lambda times xi dot. So this term is really xi dot. What is the rest of it? I'll tell you what is this H matrix. But that's xi dot. This is lambda. This is eta. So for a moment, assume that, for a moment, assume that there is no uh, motion constraint. In other words, k equals zero. If there is no motion control, then matrix P is going to be full rank, and I minus P is literally be zero rank. When I minus P is zero rank, it literally means this whole term can be considered gone. This is not going to go anywhere. It's not going to give me anything. So now look. Is what I have right now the motion control in the task space? Absolutely. All I need is to go back and look at what I had. Remember, if I wanted to do motion control in the task space, what did I do? I had an inner loop and an outer loop. What was the inner loop? What was the outer loop? The inner loop was to cancel what? 
to cancel the nonlinear terms and the outer loop was, in this case, if you look, it was a PD control plus fit forward, right? So that's what you see here. Instead of PD, I have used PID. Can I uh, neglect the I term? Yes, I can. If there is no what? A steady state error, then I can neglect the I term and just use PD. And this is definitely PD because as you can see, I have what? P. P is proportional. Proportional to what? What error? Here I have pose error, XE. If you remember, X is what? The pose of the uh, end effector. So I have an ideal pose and I have what? An actual pose. And if I subtract these two, I can get what? I can get a position error. And then the derivative of the pose is the velocities of the end effector or xi. So here, that's your derivative term, kd. And I can integrate also that pose error and get my i term if I have what? A steady state error. So that's your PID. Correct? That's your PID control. Then what? What are the rest of the terms here? This is your gamma xi dot plus eta. What's the role of that? Gamma xi dot eta, what does that do? And what does this G transpose do? So uh, here to explain it, I'll write my equation of motion one more time for you here. F is gamma xi dot plus eta. Correct? This is my equation of motion. And what is F itself? You know that tau and F are related, correct? The joint on the torx and the end effector uh, wrench, F, are related. How are they related? Well, guess what? We had it in the past, and in general, tau is equal to J transpose F, correct? So, so it's equal to J transpose, where F, yeah, let me do it this way, where F here is this term. So if you multiply this by J transpose, that's your tau. Now, how do I achieve the motion that I want? I say, well, this tau, I select it to be also J transpose times something. What's the advantage of that? The advantage is when you put the two sides equal, right? The both J transpose, if you are not in a singular position, you can eliminate it, either by multiplying by J transpose inverse or pseudo inverse. If I can do that, now what do I want to include in here? Well, we know that the terms eta and lambda are nonlinear. So if we want to end up with a linear control, we need to eliminate these guys. So the first thing I do, I say this should be the same uh, lambda or at least the best approximate of that so I can put the hat on it times whatever linear term that I want and then what plus again my eta or the best estimate of eta I mean really you should hat a hat here because this is the best you can approximate these terms Okay, the same thing here, really. That's, that's, I, ideally, yes, I can get them perfectly, but not really, other than in simulation, I cannot get them perfectly. And then I add my linear term. So what's the good thing if I choose this tau to be my control law? When I set these two sides and say equal, then ideally I can eliminate the tau, the j's, j transpose, by multiplying by j as long as I'm not in a singular position. 
then the inside the parentheses are going to be the same. And when they are the same, then the etas can be eliminated. So now gamma times xi dot equals gamma times whatever term is in here. And now if I can eliminate the what? The lambdas, then now xi dot here will be equal to whatever I want inside the parentheses. And here, to make it a linear differential equation, I make this xi dot d plus kp times x error and let's say plus kd times the derivative of the error which is xi error so now from these two i will get what all i need is to bring xi dot to the other side so it's going to be xi d double dot minus xi dot and then plus kp or let me use kd first kd times xi error and then plus kp times x error equals zero and this guy itself is xi error dot right so now if i take a time derivative from this it is going to be xi error double dot plus kd xi error dot plus kp xi error equals zero. And as long as I choose my kd and kp properly, like for example, choose this to be diagonal of two omegas and this guy to be diagonal of omega squared, then I can guarantee that my xi error of t will be whatever it was in the beginning and times an exponential function. Right? So you clearly see that uh, I have convergence to zero. Now, if I add the integral term, I have to take another time derivative, and it's going to be a third order um, equation, differential equation. So now I will have the zeta e triple dot plus kd double dot plus kp e dot plus ki e, xi e equals zero, and now I have to... Uh, solve for the roots of a cubic polynomial as characteristic equation as opposed to what? The uh, quadratic, because here my characteristic polynomial is s squared plus uh, kds plus kp equals zero. And if I want the s to be equal to negative omega, selection of kd and kp is much easier compared to something like this. Not that it's impossible, of course you can do it, right? Of course you can do it, but in general, the reason, as I told you, that in many of the formulas, they do not include the integral term and they just go with the PD control instead of a PID control is that proof of convergence and finding the gains is much, much easier analytically compared to when you raise the order of everything by one. But if you have steady state error, it is always a good idea to add what? The integral term with the small gains. And then if the, still the steady state error doesn't go away, you want to bump up a little bit the I gain. You definitely don't need to use big gains because it makes the system unstable. So clearly you see why I have J transpose. Why I have what? Lambda behind the whole parenthesis, as you can see. And then outside that parenthesis, I have what? I have my eta term. Okay, so it is very clear how the motion control, in this case, it is doing its job. As long as I had no motion constraint. Now, if k is not equal to zero, 
then not all of these equations that I will get out of the control law should be used for motion control. Out of n of them, only n minus k should be used. That's where I multiply this whole term by what? By the P matrix. So it only gives me n minus k equations, not all of the n equations. And what would you do about the force now? Now, k of your components need the force control because in k directions, you cannot move. So what would you do? First, use I minus P matrix behind them. So whatever uh, force control rule that you choose, it is not applied to all n degrees of freedom. It only is applied to k degrees of freedom because the rank of this matrix is k. And how would you control the force? Well, we exactly do it the same way we did force control in my previous video. If you remember, how did we do force control? We tried to eliminate the nonlinear terms, right? If we did it in joint control, we added C and G. In this case, all of that is being written into the eta term. So I add eta term to get rid of that. And then if you remember, I added a feed forward term plus a PI control or a PD or a PID, depending on what controller you use. But it's always a feed forward plus some feedback term, right? And that's exactly what you see again down here, if you look. This is your PI control. And this is your fit forward control. So that's exact same thing as we had last time, except now our nonlinear terms are included in eta. That's why we include what? Eta here. Okay? And so that eliminates the nonlinear terms. The rest of the linear terms here will give me a second order linear differential equation for force, which the error in the force goes to zero exponentially by appropriate selection of KP and KI. And so you see here, by combining these two, I'll get to my hybrid. I get into my what? Hybrid um, force motion control. And I told you why you need a J transpose in the beginning, because tau is equal to J transpose times F. And everything was written as F equals gamma xi dot plus eta. Since we wrote in the task space, but the control law is applied to the motors. For motors, what you need to control is their torques. You cannot control the force of the motors, right? You control the torque of the motors. So that's where this J transpose term comes into play. Now, the only thing that I have not explained about this uh, hybrid rule is this guy. Why is it that instead of xi dot trans, uh, xi dot uh, derivative, uh, xi d dot, I'm sorry, the desired xi dot, why is it that I first multiplied by a homogeneous transformation matrix H, then uh, took time derivative? Because here, also, if you look at your Jacobian, J, it's also written as JB. So what is it here? The thing is, uh, every uh, motion constraint, every force desired, everything here is described in the end effector frame. Okay, not in the uh, inertial frame. What we need is to describe the... Um, end effector velocity and the end effector force. And we describe those vectors, which is xi desired, right? Specifically, and f desired. We try to de describe them in the end effector frame. And we do, that's no problem. But when we do xi and f in the end effector frame, we have to also Describe other entities in the end effector frame. So one of them is J. This J is described in end effector frame, JB, that you can see, as well as this desired uh, uh, twist, right? You uh, use this um, homogeneous transformation matrix, which takes you from the 
uh, frame XD. And what is XD? XD is the um, basically the compliant frame that we had up here. So it takes it from here and project it onto the end effector frame. Not necessarily the end effector frame and this compliant frame are the same. Okay, and to project your, as I said, the um, desired twist from that frame to the end effector frame, I use this H of D with respect to E. Other than that, everything is quite clear. Again, I mentioned that this eta in general is proper to write it as eta hat as well as this to be uh, gamma hat, even J. Okay, because we do our best to determine them. It's not necessarily an easy task to do. And uh, your system identification has to be perfect. You have to know everything perfectly. Otherwise, you're just trying to get some guesses. Okay, the goal of those guesses is to make the amount of nonlinear terms as small as possible. And then hopefully your integral term in the PD or PID does a little bit more help to bring down the amount of error to the minimal that it could. Uh, let me just mention one thing before I stop the video. And um, the hard thing here about this uh, hybrid motion force control is the form of these constraints that you have, a times i equals zero, it's not always easy to get these, the forms of these constraints in a nice Fafian form, as you can see here. Why? The major thing is your environment does have uncertainty. Okay? Your environment does have uncertainty. And you might say, like, what? Well, guess if you are uh, trying to do that writing with the pen, guess what happens if this plane on which you are writing is not perfectly flat? It has a little bit up and down. What's going to happen to you? I mean, in this case, yes, I can say, my velocity component in the z direction is zero that's my constraint but what if at this point that you're writing there is a small bump in here then what then your pen is not going to push on this perfectly flat plane it is now going to push on what going to push on a bump and so now you have to have the local normal, right, and gradient and everything at that point in order to come up with the equations of the constraint. So this is very good when you have everything flat, everything under control, as long as your robot end effector does deal with surfaces that are irregular, that the normal to them does not stay constant and constantly changes, you have to have a way to update the form of this Fafian constraint. Because if you don't, then the A matrix does change in reality, but not in your equation. And guess what? Everything in here does depend on your A matrix. Okay? Because everything depends on P, and a big component in your P is what? Your A matrix. So if your A matrix is a bad estimate, your P is bad, and that is going to change your performance significantly. So what would you do when you are dealing with such cases? Well, uh, one of it is if you can identify the constraints in real time based on, let's say, a force feedback. So if at the end effector you have a tactile sensor or you use your FT sensor or something, so when the force components do change, you say, hey, there is something going on, right? So again, going back to the example of the plate and writing on it, if the only, and this is my end effector, and it has this FT sensor here, 
at the moment, the only force that the FT sensor is showing to me is FZ. So let's say again, I'm holding this pen and I'm writing. I'm monitoring my Fs. So this is FZ, right? This is, let's say, FY. This is FX. If the only force I see is FZ and no FX and no FY like this, I know that I'm writing on a perfectly a flat XY plane. But as long as, oh, no, now I'm, get, I'm getting some non-zero FY or non-zero FX. Now what? Now I know the normal to the uh, plane is not only in the Z direction. I, only have, I also have X and Y. So now the surface has a bump or something, and the normal to it now might have all three or two components. So if I can estimate which direction is the normal direction, I can re-update or uh, re-calculate uh, and update my A matrix based on these four sensors, then I should hopefully be able to uh, control everything properly. The other thing we can do is uh, we basically allow for some error, okay? we might be able to allow for some error and sacrifice some performance. By using what? By using small gains of the feedback system. So basically what? It means bring down this KP, KI, and KD, which is, hey, if uh, I am writing on a bump or something, and I cannot still follow the trajectory that is expected from me, don't worry. Do not push too hard on the motors to make such motion happen. Bring down your gains a little bit. Okay, so as long as I'm writing on the flat surface, I'm doing my job perfectly. When I get to the bump, right, when I get to the bump, so let's say this is my path that I'm going to follow. If I get to the bump, and I get a little bit oscillations here, that's okay. Because my surface is not perfect, so if my robot does not write perfectly, I'm okay. Because I used small gains. If I still use big gains and I don't update my A, guess what's going to happen? My joints are trying to push hard for it to follow the exact path, and that makes the amount of force that this one is applying to the environment go big and that makes the pen get broken so you might sacrifice some performance or try to update your uh, a matrix in real time which is not a trivial task another way you can do it is you can basically use the impedance control which does not treat the environment as fully rigid and try to treat the environment as having somewhat some uh, impedance or some basically stiffness but finite stiffness so when i get there again that's the goal of impedance control i'm not treated as fully rigid i treat it as something softer and that is kind of like you are changing your gains basically that's that's the same as the second approach and that we're going to see in the next video so hopefully this um intro to a hybrid force motion control, which is an advanced topic, was useful to you. I will, in one of my future videos, create a demo, a MATLAB Simulink demo for you. And in a separate video, I'll explain it because that could be a video of its own and I don't want to make this video extremely long. So I'll stop the video at this point, and in one of my future videos, I'll show you a MATLAB Simulink demo for this topic specifically. So thank you so much for your attention. I will see you in my next video. Thanks.